that would be our uh, panel discussion coming up, which has got to do with the global talk, that is the new retail world, finding out how you know the world can also learn from India and vice versa. So this would be a very interesting panel discussion. And um, as the stage is uh, getting set up out here, you can see that slight makeover happening for the stage because we have quite a few panelists. This is truly a powerful talk coming in uh, just before lunch as well. Great, so I think with that, let's go ahead. Uh, let's have our panelists uh, on the stage. They are all set. So without much ado, let me invite them right away. Uh, let's first invite the moderator for this panel discussion. We have with us the CEO for Freeport India. May I have Dr. Benu Segal on the stage, please. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And joining her, we have with us the Managing Director and CEO of Pepe Jeans India, Mr. Manish Kapoor. We also have CEO of Cinepolis India, Devang Sampath. Joining them is the Managing Director of UFC Gym India and Director and Co-Founder of Greeny Energy and Purisho Handcrafted Soaps, that's Ishta Kansari. We also have them joining uh, the Head of Retail Services, North India and International Business Development, India JLL. We have Mr. Sharad Nagpal. And joining them is also the CEO of Gravis Food Private Limited, that is Baskin Robbins. So we have Mr. Mohit Qatar. We also have the Executive Director of Madhava Donuts, Tarak Bhattacharya. And joining them is the CEO of Mr. DIY, Manish Sharma, and Director of Key Demand, Karthik Krishna. All right. So, Dr. Segal, over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. It's a very important session, as you know, what is in store for us in future. Future has always intrigued us. Evolution is bound to happen, but the problem is evolution is inevitable, but it is also invisible. We actually don't know. We keep on studying the trends of today and keep predicting the future. Another important line is the cash box has to jingle. Everything should percolate where my buck should go so that my cash box keep jingling all the time. We have different categories. We are very lucky that we are able to touch upon all the categories. I don't think if we have left out any. But what is future in and ever-changing global world? Trade embargoes happening. What is that bringing into my business? And as I know that India itself is a universe of business here where we don't depend on the world. When the world is under recession, we are prospering because of the sheer population. So it has always intrigued me and it has intrigued you as well. Where do we go from here? Whether it is digital, whether it is only digital, whether it is digital, whether it is metaverse, or whether it is I don't know what, what is the crystal ball saying? I'm going to ask each one of you category-wise and get also some knowledge out of it and see what is future calling us to do. So as we can see that we have cinema, we have jeans, we have apparels, we have uh, a category which has come from Malaysia to the problem solving through the traditional way of um, selling ice creams. So I don't know from where to start, but I'll start from you, Karthik. So interesting, Karthik is bringing a change in the world of how to look for spaces. Traditionally, we have brokers and we have retailers who are looking for expansion. So Karthik, can you throw some light upon how you're making change in this world? Uh, thank you, Vinny. Uh, so, just wanted to introduce uh, Key Demand. Uh, key Demand is an interesting concept, which is a B2B marketplace. The idea of Key Demand stemmed from the fact that, okay, uh, how do we cater uh, space to the whole of India? Especially, you know, for retailers who have a problem on finding the right real estate solutions across the country. Um, everybody in the uh, organized real estate space, especially the consultants, the owners, the, the developers, all have a challenge to meet the right retailers on their end. So, especially throwing the same thing back, we posed it to a lot of retailers, what is it that they'd like to simplify? A majority of them came back telling us, okay, um, listen, I'd like to go to about 100 cities, but can I actually go there? Can I physically visit 100 cities and find spaces? Which stemmed back to us saying that, how can we create this? How can we let this happen? So, Key Demand is a demand-led platform 
which basically poses the demand out there for anybody who can supply the real estate. And by, by organizing this effectively, what it does is it simplifies things for any consumer. Could it be retail, could it be F&B, it could be commercial office space tomorrow. The idea is to specify the requirement and then let the, the demand reach you. So it's supply demand led situation and this is effectively what we want to throw out there. Um, it's for any retailer today, you know, specifying this, getting the supply that's, re that's required, sorting this out in an organized, effective manner without 100 emails reaching his account. That's what key demand is all about. And this is to simplify real estate for a lot of the people. It's also to organize the business development practice, which has become sort of dysfunctional because the business development team teams keep changing, you know, for any organization which is top heavy, this makes it very light for them. They can go about, expand into 100, probably 400 towns across the country. And one thing I'd like to say is, with India especially, till the, you know, the average age of the country is about 26 years now. And for the next 20 years, we're going to see the glory days of the country because till the average age reaches about 40 years, there's continual growth that is going to set in this country. And I think expansion is going to reach tier 5, tier 6 towns as well because everybody is aspiring and I think that's where we are, we are here to stay. So in short, Key Demand is a B2B marketplace uh, for everybody to come and use it and you know to get the benefits of it. Thank you so much, Karthik. I see so much of uh, ease for retailers now. It is just one click away. Expansion is just one click away. But now in pandemic where digital was necessity is it becoming my choice in this world devang now in this world where sometimes sometimes digital is my choice how is cinema faring so uh, yeah uh, i mean first of all cinema whether we talk about uh, wait wait a minute let me introduce devang is from cinepolis so that's why the question is to him. And Cinepolis is a multiplex chain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, whether it is cinema, any other retail, they both coexist is a proven uh, phenomena, not only in India, but across the globe. Uh, having said that, cinema is not about movies, it's about experience. Uh, movies can be seen anywhere, but when you go out, traditionally we used to have a cinema which will only exhibit movies and we have some packed food. Now from there, move shifting on, uh, you plan your meal, you plan your experience the entire day outing in the mall. So in that entire experience, cinema is one more contributor. Absolutely, there is no replacement of uh, whether it's, it, as we say that it's not digital versus uh, physical or digital versus the, uh, you know, the on-premise experience. It's and. We, the both will coexist. In fact, just to put things in perspective, Brahmastra, the movie release, had the highest opening weekend ever in the history of India. So that clearly proves that uh, you know Indian audience still wants to come out uh, with lot of uh, you know uh, negativity around Bollywood, which, as they say, that uh, you know the. Only 3.5% of the India population currently is going for a movie, whether it is in multiplex or in single screen. So it is only going to grow from here. Uh, if it goes to, let's say, even 7%, it, the size will get double. So experience we are seeing year on year is only increasing. With more number of screen coming up, more people are turning out. It is an experience which we need to give a right hygiene, right FNB experience. And when the experience is right, people want to come back again and again. Couldn't agree more. Experience is the key word. Having said that, I come to ice creams because I've got a sweet tooth. So we have here with us Mohit, who has been running my favorite brand, Baskin Robbins, for long. So I was always thinking, has pandemic affected us? Or has the digital wave affected you guys? Another thing is, how is the changing global scene brought change to your business and to other business now that Ukraine war is there, trade embargoes are there in China. So how do you put in these things, perspective your business? Uh, I'll take your question in two parts. Uh, 
Please do. Uh, to begin with, uh, did the pandemic affect a category like ice creams? Uh, obviously, I think the pandemic affected many categories, including ice cream, especially at the height of it. Fortunately, the entire industry is now out of it and growing exceptionally well. The entire F&B category, whether it's us or whether it's other food categories, are growing very, very well. The one change that it brought about was increasing acceptance of online ordering and therefore uh, deliveries, etc. Uh, and the businesses, all businesses in the F&B industry have adapted to that very, very well. Uh, for us, specifically, a third of our business is now coming from online channels, whether it's e-commerce or whether it's aggregator platforms, etc., etc., which, which of course puts different kinds of pressures, but the businesses have adapted very well and growing exceptionally well. That's at one level. Your second question was on the changing equation around the world, equations around the world. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, a lot of things are happening, whether, uh, you know, forced by political events or changing geopolitical circumstances or changing bilateral relations between countries. Or, uh, you know, there are things happening in China and Russia and Middle East has strained relations with some other parts of the world, etc., etc. But rather than seeing it as a constraint, uh, you could look at it as an opportunity. Because uh, some of these countries like Russia, China, were playing good, you know, were playing a very strong role in, in the global supply uh, chain. Today, they are not so strong. And that opens up an opportunity for countries like India to start supplying to parts of the world where they were supplying hitherto. So, for instance, there could be an opportunity of supplying into the Middle East region, there could be an opportunity of supplying into the Far East region, etc., etc., and that is how brands need to look at in terms of how they could expand and they could start supplying to those parts, supplying their products to other parts of the world. That's at one level. There is also the entire thing of, you know, uh, for example, uh, bilateral relations being strained, for instance, between a leading country in the Middle East and Qatar, you know, there, there is some tension. But that opens up an opportunity for India to start supplying into Qatar. Uh, not just ice creams, but there could be many, many other products. And therefore, the opportunity for India, given its growing importance in the world, is only growing. That's at one level. The other thing I would like to say is that India economy, fortunately, has been on a very, very strong wicket. And especially if I was to look at the, uh, the growth rates in metro cities, in tier one cities, have been exceptionally strong. And which means that there is an opportunity for the Indian businesses to start growing expanding their chains, expanding their networks within India itself as well. So, uh, it all seems very bright when you, when you look at it uh, from these lenses. That's very encouraging and very good way of looking at things. So, we have another brand which has come from Malaysia. And it is looking for footholds in India, which I think is very strong. And uh, now, what I see was very big DIY stores and uh, you have been opening up to the tune of 15,000 square feet to now it has shrunk to 6,000. So since we have a big panel, so maybe the chances will be less that I'll come back to you. So I'll ask you two questions. Is how is your expansion in India based? On what basis is it resting? And how are you finding the optimal store size for this category? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Binu. Uh, it's an exciting category to be in India. And, uh, you know, before joining DIY, I just narrated a story that I was in the store. Uh, you know, just got to know that DIY is open, so I just visited the store. And my God, what skills they have, you know, uh, that time. Now I can say we have. So <laughs> I just entered it without thinking that I'll buy something, but uh, when I went out, it was like bag full of daily necessity things that we require in our house. I think we excel in that, and the price was fantastic. You know, I have not seen a, in retail a skew at 19 rupees, at uh, 20 rupees in a mall. So I was so excited with this category, and I said that okay, you know, uh, sometimes maybe probably I'll connect with them. But now, you know, I'm leading this uh, brand in India, and it's been very exciting. We started in uh, 19, uh, 2019 December, to be very precise, and then you know what happened two, three waves of COVID. But I think in these times also we have opened around 75 stores, looking strong to open another 75 stores by March. So my average should be 12 to 15 stores every month. That's what has been asked. 
And it is very surprising to know that Malaysia being a small country, it has got around 1,000 plus stores. So that shows that there is a capacity of a customers to go and buy in these kind of stores where you sell day-to-day -day daily items in your store. So that's been very good for us. And I think uh, this is the first part of your question, what you asked. And the second part is, uh, I am OK to open as far as Riva, Katni, Sagar, uh, Bilaspur, because my best stores are doing very good in tier two and tier three cities. And I'm really scared to go up Bandra or in Delhi. Why? Because you know the rentals are very high. But my, if I ask my team, OK, I want these many stores in this city, compared to what I need from uh, Churchgate to Borivali, they say I'll take that part of the, uh, <laughs> because it's easy to get, and, and, and we are getting good support from the landlord also because the footfalls are coming in. And uh, the best stores are really doing very good in Pune kind of city, and uh, Bhopal, Indore has also given us very good sales. So yeah, we are on the right track, right expansion, and definitely we are also connecting with the manufacturers in India so that they can uh, you know, supply to the DIY brand. We have got 2,500 stores across 12 countries now, and we have just entered Spain and Portugal as well. So there is a chance for Indian manufacturer also to connect with us and you know, <clears throat> give their product across the globe. I am so happy to hear that tier two and tier three cities are giving you so good results. That only shows the penetration in my country and accepting a Malaysian brand. That makes me think a Spanish brand that we have. Uh, and what is the thing that we should think for tier two cities in your expansion? Is my customer globally aware of Pepe Jeans, and do you think, we were talking about customer experience here somewhere, uh, so uh, what is the kind of customer experience you require to sell this kind of thing, and how are we managing the e-commerce along with that? So, uh, as in, in terms of the classic bit, in terms of saying, uh, and we, we were having a discussion with Mohit in terms of the consumer, so we fundamentally, in, in terms of India, what I have seen, uh, or we at Pepe have seen is that effectively as in uh, uh, somewhere we are tier agnostic there and I fundamentally say it in terms of that there is a Bharat even in Mumbai and there is a India even in a Gorakhpur. So effectively there is as in the consumer strata that we are catering to as in there is a consumer even in the smaller tier two, tier three cities. So and that's what as in when we are looking at uh, expansion and then we are looking at experiences, our idea is that we should be able to deliver the same sort of uh, experience to consumer across the board uh, and it should be agnostic of the city that he or she is ex uh, residing in. And that's where again as in the second part that you said in terms of the whole e-commerce bit. Uh, so the reality is that as in when we are looking at business today, when we are looking at channels today, uh, we are saying that the consumer is channel agnostic. Uh, he or she doesn't decide today whether he wants to shop online or offline. Uh, we are in a segment wherein a lot of purchases are driven by instinct which are driven and the consumer should be free to choose as in how he wants to interact with us. The idea should be that we should be able to deliver the same sort of experience to the consumer uh, wherever he or she wants to shop from. So in terms of a offline world as in that consumer experience might translate in terms of the look and feel of the store or how I treat them in the store in terms of the consumer service. In terms of an off uh, online scenario, Things like as in time of delivery, speed of delivery in terms of how better they are able to navigate my site, how better are they, are they able to in terms of am I able to, because I know that particular customer much better, how better I am able to as in uh, prop them in terms of what is right for them or what will work for them better. That is the sort of experience that I should be able to deliver. So it's all about as in in terms of a unified customer and that's what we are working at the back end that as in a Benu at a store and a Benu at a, uh, uh, my online site as in today they are two different entities. How am I able to combine them and see that she's transacting three times with me at a store and two times uh, on the site and how does, and, we, and mind you as in when we are seeing that, we are also seeing that there are customers who differ in terms of their customers when they are buying full price or they want to buy something new, they are transacting at a store, but when they are looking at a deal, they are coming to the site. But those are the areas that we are looking at and the idea is that to deliver that unified consumer experience. 
Thank you so much, Manish. But then uh, there was an interesting point, Benu in the store and Benu online. So as for me, I think that we have five senses and all my five senses has to work when I'm buying something. Uh, but it, it depends on each one individually. Uh, you have a tangible product and you can still you know, play around with it. And you can create experience here uh, online and you can create in-store experience as well. I'm very intrigued at your product, Ishtia. So you are handling with a very thing which is very not tangible, it's service driven, it is something to do with health, which is also something people are very sensitive about now. So can you throw some light, how are you going to expand in the future, handle things, uh, the consumer who is so digitally inclined and how are you making your gyms that are uh, uh, satisfying their needs? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think it's very important to understand first is what was the past. If you look at the gym space in the last 50 years, it's really evolved. You look, uh, look back to 1970s, up to the 1970s, gyms were all about pumping iron. So you come in, you do hardcore weight training, men-centric. When you come to 80s, you see aerobics coming in, power yoga coming in. So there was a move away from uh, weight training. More women came into the gym. Cardio was introduced back in the 80s. So that was a major change the way gyms were designed. Moving forward now, as we come back to the last decade, if you look at it, it's a technology which is creating disruption. Now, just before the pandemic happened, there were two or three companies which got into a service which involves sending gym to your home, which involves an instructor which is online through a, a, chan a platform, and you have an equipment which was available. These companies became unicorn in a matter of 12 months because they rode on the wave which came with pandemic. Now for us as a company, uh, there are two things which are very important. One is the uh, experience that we offer because gyms are no more a place where you go and pump iron and do an exercise. So there where you have to have a blend of an online and offline uh, workout that we offer. Now either you bring your customers to the gym or you engage them online or you offer a dual platform. So if you're a corporate executive, I see this room full of corporate executive and the biggest challenge that you face today is once you uh, go back home, it's very difficult to go back to the gym. So we are giving you an option where I have an online coach, you can log into your phone, you can log into your iPad and do your workout. You have pre-recorded workouts, you have workouts uh, which are, you know, uh, going live across 24 hours. So as a brand, we have, uh, UFC gym is present across 20 uh, countries right now. We have 200 clubs. So we're building this platform called Box Hit Live, where we will be running 200 live classes round the clock. So that's the value that you get uh, coming in, and it's more of an experience. And yes, uh, as I said, experiential marketing, uh, it's very difficult to get people in the gym. Uh, if I have to ask, how many of you are here going to the gym or an active membership? Can you raise your hands? How many have an active membership here? It's less than 2% of the total population. So it's a very difficult space we are in, unlike retail, where you have a shop, people come to the mall and walk in. For us, to get people in the gym first, just to have a look at it, is a big challenge. So future for gym is going to be a tech and your uh, on-ground retail store, proper blend of it, and give an offering. If you're at home, you're traveling, your workout travels with you, and that will be supported with hardware and software, which will come along with the gym. Interesting. People, lazy people like me will also have to work out, it looks like. So that brings me with a shortage of time to my sweet with a hole. Uh, so, again, my su sweet tooth, it's very, very interesting. Your product is very interesting. Mad out. I am mad over donuts. So am I. So, health not So, uh, uh, Tarek, can you show throw some light in this world wherein last, remember last, uh, uh, this thing, somebody said that India is dominated by Indian sweets. In this world, how is donut surviving and surviving well and how do you see it forward, future? What are the trends and how do you, what do you think when you're opening another store? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, to start with, uh, donuts as a category was like only available, donuts were only available in sometime in a coffee shop and they used to sell like a dozen maybe a day. 
or maybe much lesser than that. And it took us almost three years to start with doing things when we opened a store at Breach Candy where we thought that people would have experienced donuts in the Western world and that's how Sobo happened and South Bombay people started accepting it and then it floated around in the country. And that gave us a huge hope of uh, establishing the brand as a category and the category on its own. So um, it was always a niche category for the last few years and I thought a uh, few other entrants which came into the market would have helped us. Unfortunately not, but we are still sailing on a good space. I think uh, we are doing well as an organization, as a brand, with the product. Uh, yeah, apart from donuts, I think we are also doing a uh, little bit here and there in terms of brownie. We are doing uh, waffles in the stores right now. In the future, I think there's a huge demand of, uh, there's a sugar-free donut, which unfortunately in an indulgence product of ours, I don't know why we'll want, people want to have sugar-free, but that's been a category which people are asking. Uh, there has been a huge demand for vegan donuts, surprisingly. Yeah, uh, people also want uh, donuts with plant meat. Uh, so it, I don't know. It could be there. There it could be a market in the future, but that's what the demand is in the future. But right now, making it a staple category and supplying to everybody, and we that's why we have started calling ourselves as modern mithai. So instead of giving laddus and uh, kaju katlis of the world during Diwali and Raksha Bandha, people have started accepting us and. We sell those small bite boxes in numbers, which is like a small box of gifting. So yeah, I think as a brand, uh, we could manage the market and I think we are here to stay. I am sure you are there to stay. I'll go hungry otherwise. In this ever-changing world, the biggest challenge is to find the suitable space for retailers. And which is a big challenge for you, Sharad. Sharad represents JLL, which is helping retailers to grow faster, suggest good places. And as Karthik, because I started with Karthik, I'm ending it with you, uh, both the places are, both the categories are very, very essential. While he's doing the tech way, you are still not going that tech wise. So how is that, that you are able to satisfy all your, you have both the sides, the client side, the retailer side. How is that you are taking the business forward? Uh, thanks, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll try and answer your question in uh, three parts, uh, and uh, and also the topic about global talk. Uh, I'll try and get some uh, international elements also in, into this. So interestingly, what has happened is that post pandemic, uh, the biggest uh, challenge for physical retail right now is to get the attention span of the customer. It was always very important, but for physical retail, that has become the biggest challenge, what I feel now in the, in the post-pandemic world. And not just, it's my belief, it's what uh, our international teams are also telling us. So interestingly, uh, in developed nations like Japan, China, the US, the attention span has fallen down to as low as less than 20 seconds. So, so if a teenager walks into an athleisure store, doesn't get excited, by what he sees, not just by the product, but the entire experience. He's just, just going to go out and, you know, or go, or go on to the app and order from there. So I think uh, uh, we've been talking about F&B as a category uh, going, uh, growing in prominence because of the experience that they bring to the table uh, in terms of shopping center. The way we see at JLL is that experience as a category probably will grow across retailing categories. If you can't bring in experience inside the store, be it cinemas like Devang mentioned, you just cannot have your shoppers coming back to the stores again and again, season after season, launch after launch. They're just gonna go online, as uh, our uh, panelist also mentioned that, you know, we're gonna be available wherever customers want, want us to be. So for them, it's easier uh, to be online, they'll go online, so how to attract customer? Second is that um, the agility with which international retailers are adapting to Indian market dynamics now. You know, gone are those days when uh, retailers entered, looked at metros, then at smaller cities, and then at further smaller cities. That's absolutely out of the window now. You, you have a category, you have a market ready, uh, digital has, has given exposure to everyone and not just the top seven metros or top eight um, larger cities. As uh, Manish also uh, rightly mentioned that there is a Bharat in every India and in there's an Indian in every Bharat. Just to draw that analogy again. Uh, uh, you know, that's how retailers are thinking and that's why you see uh, today a Uniqlo coming and rationalizing the store size within three years of being present. 
you see Tim Hortons coming with a 300 uh, store plan and opening three stores in a span of 10 days. And with a, such a wide Indianized menu uh, in terms of food offerings. So what does that tell you? It tells you that brands are listening to the customer. They're reading the market very well. And they're agile enough to adapt and then launch and not just learn while, while they keep on uh, uh, op uh, opening their stores one by one. So I think uh, these are experience and agility. And that's the only thing you know, which is going to survive uh, in the future. Couldn't agree more, but then you know what is my dream? My dream is Indian brands going out. And they proliferating. Yeah, that's also happening, yeah. yeah. That's also happening so a yeah, lot now. I see. Yeah. I see in Dubai. I see something in London. But this should happen more and yeah. I should have more of those brands. This is my dream. And that will be true globalization for Absolutely. us. It is not influx, but efflux should also happen. I know most of you represent uh, brands from a outside India, but still that, that is my dream, personal dream, that should happen. Uh, so we are finished with most of the things what we had to say category-wise. So is it all right if I open the uh, panel for uh, Q&A? We are open for Q&A, anybody if you want to ask any questions. We seem to have satisfied all of them. <laughs> any questions? There is? Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, so it was an amazing discussion. Uh, thank you to all the speakers thank and panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, like, if you can enlighten us, what are the, so, uh, the overall thought process is, India is massively going to build its retail infra over the next two decades. What are the top one or two or three challenges that you see in terms of actually kind of living up to that potential? Is the question directed to any particular person or anybody from the panel can take? I think it is directed to almost everybody, but uh, I, I think you are the better. Yeah. Manish. I think when, today when I am, you know, trying to expand my brand in tier 2 and tier 3 cities, what I look for is group of retailers coming together and making that pocket very successful. And that's, that will help all the retailers because you have got a reason for the customer to travel because the customer is traveling from villages or some towns and they want to come to this place. So today the challenge is that I'm not able to find that mix. If I go alone and do my shop, I don't know whether I'll be able to attract those customers or not. But if, 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 uh, if four or five brands come together, work closely and open something, then definitely it's going to work. So we have good examples in Punjab, you know, where in the highways they have opened a lot many brands. Don't know from where the customer is coming, but the business is still there. So it says that, yes, there are pockets where we can explore. There are, there are pockets where people have got a lot of money and they can come and expand, you know, do, uh, do shopping with us. So that pocket is difficult to find, but it's not impossible also. Um, I'd like to add to what he's just saying. Uh, there are a lot of outlet malls which are planned across the country, and I think that's the answer to key infrastructure gateways, which we call on, on highways especially. We are seeing uh, much higher, uh, you know, brand presence coming up, you know, in across the uh, tier one cities as well. If you look at the highways planned across Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, and going forward, I think this will get implemented in the in the in the smallest of cities, you know. And Punjab is a very classic example. There are a lot of developers who are looking at, okay, what is the next big thing that will come up, right? And going forth, we are going to see. You, if you look at the outlet mall culture in the US and Europe, I think that's what is being adapted. And I'm sure all the retailers here agree with me that they are seeing thoroughfare in, that, in those markets as well. And especially a lot of these produce that are coming is one season old, but with a blend of already existing you know, uh, season as well. So I think there's a huge uh, requirement for this infrastructure to come up. A lot of developers across the country are looking to, you know, br to bring this infrastructure because I think that's the next big thing. In, a, in able to cater, like, you know, recently near the Bangalore airport, we've seen about 25 brands come together under one destination. So these are the ones that are going to go forth and I think this is the, the next big thing that's going to happen in the tier three, tier four markets across India. So as in, I'll just sum it up in terms of it's basically how I look at it. If there is, as in the constraints are going to be supply, whether it's terms of space, when I look at it, it's also in terms of goods where we can produce quality suppliers and then in terms of talent that is there. So the biggest 
thing that I see in terms of constraints are on the supply side, whether you look at space, whether you look at talent, whether you look at manufacturing capabilities. So I think that's where we stand. One more thing is, what is your background? Is it the developer or a retailer bank? No, I'm, I'm just a contractor. Okay. I, so, the, you know, there are yin and yang forces, the negative and the positives. Yes. So, you will have to work out on both of them. Both of them. Like he said, finding talent, finding agencies, finding… And that will create a retail world. So, actually, actually, I'm looking at the real juice here. So, this is a little 30,000 square feet view. What I'm looking at because the entire ecosystem is here, if the panelists can guide us, what is like, what is going on in your mind on day-to-day -day basis? What are the, what are the challenges you are facing today in making that plan that you already chucked out, making that plan happen? If some insight, you know, maybe technology-wise is in, inventory is your problem, is category planning is your problem, is space build out fit out is your problem, and what are the potential workarounds that you are kind of thinking what are the key solutions that you are kind of working on is probably the something that will enlighten all of us. Actually, contracting is a problem, so we can meet <laughs> offline. <laughs> I think all the, the signals are coming that we are yeah, running short the of the time. time is so up, we, we can, can meet there yeah, and we can okay. answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been such a lovely audience. Thank you so much.